Good morning, McLaren. I hope everyone's having a wonderful day. Today, I'm here to talk to you about a tale of two puppies. Now, I was curious to see how much information I can get about how is it that dogs have changed so much from their ancestors? The gray wolf is considered its closest um, ancestor. Its scientific name is Canis lupus. And the scientific name for dogs is Canis lupus familiaris. They come from a very small group of gray wolves that from the, our best understanding started around 40,000 years ago between 40 to 30,000 years ago. The, I, our best guess on how this came about was that a small pack of gray wolves started hanging around humans and from there the rest is history. So between 40 to 15,000 years ago, our first um, historical record of an actual difference between what we know comes from the dog as opposed to coming from wolves is what we call the proto-dog. This was found about two years ago um, in the Czech Republic. It is approximately 28,000 years old on the left. Um, and what we can see here on the right is the two jawbone structures between dogs and their wolf counterparts. As you can see, uh, the proto-dog is on the top and the wolf is on the bottom. But what we can notice from here is that the jaw itself is actually shortening and giving us more of that more dog feature as opposed to that really elongated snout that we see in wolves. One of the reasons for this um, is that because dogs no longer need sense of as good of a sense of smell, but they require a harder crushing power because a lot of dogs would be eating scraps at this time. They would be eating a lot of bones and the harder things to eat that humans couldn't digest. So humans would either leave the scraps out and the dogs would find it and eat it, or we are starting to build that relationship with the dog itself. So becoming man's best friend, we have some really interesting evidence on how closely or how much people from a long time ago cared about their pets. 4,000 years ago, archeologists found remains of dogs, I think about 24 to 26 in multiple grave sites in Spain where they were buried next to or even with their owners, which for an older people, meant a lot. It meant that these animals were of great value to them. They cared about them. Um, in Germany, the earliest evidence was a puppy that was buried with its owner about 14,000 years ago, which is just incredible to me. And even the ancient Egyptians cared about their pets as well. We've found mummified pets in multiple tombs of people of great significance, as well as at the Saqqara necropolis. We've found a area where they have an estimated 8 million um, mummified dogs kept in that chamber. So I want to talk about an experiment done to see if we can see why or how animals can be domesticated. So we have this study that's been happening for the past 60 years started by a psychologist named Dmitry Belia in Russia who started this fox experiment. He started with a group of foxes and every as they matured he would pick the ones that were most friendly to humans the ones that weren't as timid and weren't as aggressive towards human interaction even though they were wild animals those that were more docile and more friendly and more curious as opposed to being um, retracted from human beings and human interaction they took and continued to breed them in their um, in their experiment. So they would, after those, after they matured, they would breed those with the other ones that were most um, friendly to humans. And they've continued this experiment and still going on today, even though Believ has passed away in the mid eighties. And as these generations have matured, these foxes have become more and more domesticated. The pronounced features of the 
foxes are that they are friendly to humans and now they are technically domesticated. Domesticated means that they are tolerant of humans. So when you domesticate a fox, it doesn't become a dog. Foxes are still very different creatures. Just like it, if once you domesticate a horse, it's still not a dog or a cat. So they're curious, they're playful, they get into a lot of trouble from what I've heard, but they are no longer intimidated and they can tolerate humans. So they can tolerate touch and they don't mind spending time with them and they can be in the same room without being timid or scared for the most part. Just really interesting that this has continued to happen and that even as this has happened, certain physical features of the foxes have changed. On the left, there is a pretty standard wild silver fox. And on the right is one of the more domesticated ones. It's nuzz um, nuzzling a man's hand, but it's even its ears are becoming more floppy like a dog's ears would, as well as the tails are becoming a little bit more curved on some of the specimens that are domesticated foxes. So really interesting um, features, not only their uh, temperament or their mannerisms around human beings. So let's talk about genetic changes. Now, genetics kind of are the building blocks of how something is built. On the bottom right, I have a picture of a Chihuahua and a Great Dane. It's amazing that the same species has such a genetic variance. Chihuahuas are very tiny. Great Danes are one of the largest dogs, uh, dog breeds that we have today. And I wanted to talk a little bit about some of the key genetic makeups. So real quick, one is that dogs possess a gene that allows them to eat starches as opposed to their wolf counterparts. Most wolves cannot digest grains or wheat or rice. Um, so as dogs were being raised around human beings, they had to develop the ability to eat the food that humans were eating as well. And so over time, that also happened with dogs. Now, why do we have so many different types of dogs? Well, how does this happen? Well, one of the main reasons that this has happened is because of selective breeding. Selective breeding is when, as, we're, as we have different types of dogs, we would continue to breed the ones that had specific features. So ones that are stronger and faster, they would continue to be bred so that they could help people hunt or do any other sort of work um, like that. Or if they needed a smaller dog, such as like the smaller companions that uh, royalty would have, like the Pekingese and uh, Shih Tzu. Um, but now today we have 195 recognized dog breeds from the AKC or the American Kennel Club. Another astounding thing is that genetic variation in dogs is estimated to be at a 27 and a half percent, which is incredible, especially when we compare it to humans. So as a reference, humans have about 5% genetic variation between all humans on earth. Everybody varies within a little bit around 5% but dogs are at a whopping almost 30%. And so that's how we're getting so much difference from say, the difference between Chihuahua and a Great Dane. So like I was saying, selective breeding is kind of one of the main reasons that we have this um, huge variation in dogs. <clears throat> and so over time and depending on what people needed, uh, they would breed or choose the right pup for the job. If you were, say, trying to keep a rat population down, you wouldn't want to pick an Irish wolfhound, which is on the top right. You would want to pick something a little bit smaller and a little bit quicker to get in these smaller areas, like a, top, a dash hound, the wiener dog, also known as a do dash hound. Those were bred specifically for hunting small game, like weasels and rats, and keeping those populations down. If you needed a strong dog that could help you pull in nets. The Newfoundland, which is in the middle right there, um, was bred in Canada to be able to not only work on land effectively, but also it's a very strong water dog with a very strong coat to keep it warm in those Canadian winters. And likewise, if you needed another strong dog to keep your sleds moving and through the snow, you would 
breed something like a husky. These dogs still keep a lot of their wolf-like features, but they're very strong and they're very warm. So they have a lot of ability to pull sleds and do the types of tasks that they would need to do in those more frozen regions. <clears throat> or if you needed a dog for war, you might pick something like the Sharpe, which is that really wrinkly puppy down there in the bottom right. Now I don't, I know it doesn't look that fierce, but what's amazing about the Sharpe and other dogs that get these wrinkled folds is that that comes from a gene that overproduces hyaluronic acid in their skin, which allows it to be really stretchy and kind of floppy. Why is that helpful for a dog, especially if it's fighting? It's that it's, it protects its neck from being hurt by other animals that it might be having to uh, get into combat with, as well as its ability, it can tint its skin and cause the prickly hairs on it. It has a short coat to stand up, which makes biting it also very uncomfortable for whatever's grabbing at it. Sometimes, as we're breeding all these dogs, certain ones are no longer needed. So here's an example of one called the turnspit dog, which before the industrial revolution was needed in butcher shops to run on the wheel. So on that bottom left, I have a picture. There is a dog running on a wheel that's turning the spit to cook the meat. And so they would keep these dogs on those little running wheels. So that's why they were short and had these longer but able legs to run on the wheel and keep it spinning. But as the uh, spit turning became mechanized, they were no longer needed, so they stopped breeding them. Doesn't mean that they just all went away, it's just that they were no longer regulated and needed for that purpose. So they, you could still find some of their features in maybe mutts or other dogs, but the breed itself is considered extinct. Now, <clears throat> another thing that I think is quite incredible is that we can actively see, even within the past 100 years, um, changes over time because of that selective breeding. On the far left, we have the bull advisor, which is a distant relative of what we now have today as the boxer. Uh, now, boxer dogs originally were used for guarding and they were also very good farm dogs. So in the middle, that is a picture of a boxer about 100 years ago or so. And it was a very capable dog, very uh, work-related dog. Over the years, through selective breeding, we were <clears throat> introducing and keeping some of the traits, but <clears throat> not as many as others. So as you can see on the far right, the boxer now has a very shortened snout, as well as its ears are a lot longer and floppier. And as well as you can see that the back is now pushed forward and the chest is opened up to give it more of that Oh no, stout look to it. Um, another example, and probably one of the most recognizable examples, is the pug. Pugs hundreds of years ago were, of course, still small dogs. They still had that tail, but their snouts were much longer, and they were a much slender uh, version of themselves back then. Over the years, so back, this is a picture from the 1880s of a pug that still has a bit of that snout left, but you can see that that snout's even more recessed than how it would have looked um, in the years past. And now today, pugs almost have no snout and the face is completely kind of pushed forward uh, into its uh, skull. Another one I wanted to mention is the Roman dog of war, or nowadays called the Canacorso. Its most distant ancestor would have been something like the Greek Molossus, which is the statue on the left, which is a very towering and stout dog. Oh, as they bred it through their selective breeding during Roman, uh, ancient Roman times, the uh, Cana Corso would have been used in war itself. These dogs ha have been told that they were, had armor put on them and they were used in combat. And nowadays, <clears throat> The Italian uh, Cana Corso on the far right is still bred, but it's not meant for those purposes, right? We don't, they're not meant for war anymore. So over the years, one of the things that has been bred out is some of that um, more aggressive temperament that a dog needed in war would have. 
So you can also breed out certain traits, much like the foxes were bred to keep the friendly trait, but and their kind of wild temperament taken out, you do the same thing with aggression in dogs as well. And I think another good example of that would have be the old English Mastiff. It's a very ancient kind of dog breed that in times of old would have been used to maybe hunt bear or keep royalty and people safe. Nowadays, <clears throat> we've almost bred that a temperament completely out of them and they're considered one of the most gentle dogs. They also have the record for being the world's heaviest dog. Zorba broke the Guinness Book of World Record weighing 315 pounds, which for a dog is massive. That's almost two of me. But selective breeding and causing all of these genetic changes in dogs does not come without some possible bad sides to it as well. The reason the dogs have certain traits is because their genes are programmed that have that in there. But that might also mean that there could be some underlying things that we're not seeing on like the surface level. Um, some things like the bull terrier in the bottom right from the selective breeding process that we've been using has caused them to have certain compulsive disorders. Bull terriers suffer from a compulsive disorder to chase their tail. That is not a normal behavior for a dog. That is a disorder that has been bred into that dog breed from the process of selective breeding and keeping the genetics of that specific breed so low. Similar to Dalmatians, Dalmatians do not look like they have many problems, but Dalmatians are prone to deafness because of the selective breeding process that we have chosen. Um, dachshunds, um, they have, a, we have specifically worked on shortening their legs and elongating their bodies, which has now have certain um, health problems because dachshunds are, uh, prone to hurting the vertebra in the middle because it's like a really long bridge. And so sometimes those get hurt and it can even lead to paralysis in the dogs. The German Shepherd was, is considered one of the strongest, most capable work dogs. Um, and as we've bred them, we actually think, you see how the back of the German Shepherd is a little bit sloped down? The reason that the, is, is actually possibly from a mistake on breeding terms that we accidentally introduce something that is causing that, but that is causing hip dysplasia. So the hip doesn't sit correctly with the leg anymore and can cause all sorts of medical problems for the shepherd as well. And something very similar for the Basset Hound. The Basset Hound has, um, can have some autoimmune disorders as well as uh, certain problems with their ears because of how we've upbred these dogs. Now moving forward, Let's talk about what we're doing now. As we have understood how selective breeding works and what has caused all of these potential problems, <clears throat> it allows us to go back and try and fix these things. And so uh, there's a lot of mandates and guidelines on how to keep your dogs healthy, how to give them a proper amount of genetic variance to keep them from having all of these issues. That is just about all that I have to talk about. I wanted to leave on some pictures of puppies. So on the top, of course, those are dogs. And in the bottom, we have their distant relatives, which are the gray wolf. It's amazing to me that over these thousands of years, these dogs have changed so much. All right, so I hope you also enjoyed this talk and I hope everyone has a wonderful day. Thank you, McLaren.